Hello, everybody. Welcome. Um, so I'm Cliff Kramer. I'm an adjunct professor and uh, director of the healthcare and pharmaceutical management program at, at the business school. Um, uh, the program is an area study within the school. Uh, it's focused on uh, a variety of healthcare courses that uh, we teach from a business perspective, uh, covering all the healthcare sectors, pharma, medical technologies, healthcare services, on a cross-functional basis, strategy, business development, marketing, and finance. And um, our signature event that some of you may have been to in the past is our annual healthcare conference. And please put on your calendar that it's November 22nd this year, Friday. I'll say that again, November 22nd, Friday, that uh, we'd love to see you there. Um, we're very pleased to have a uh, truly esteemed panel today. And let me uh, uh, just do a very quick intro of the panelists. I think you have more detail uh, bios in your uh, group, but let me just uh, give a quick overview. Uh, Sherry Gleed is the um, Professor of Health Policy and Management at the Mailman School. She was recently Assistant Secretary of Planning and Evaluation at HHS, so needless to say, Sherry brings a very unique perspective of health policy, both at the federal level as well as the state level, so we're thrilled that Sherry's with us today. Uh, Pat Stone is the Professor of Health Policy at uh, Columbia School of Nursing. Uh, also the director of the Center for Health Policy and director of the PhD program. Um, much of her work, uh, research, is focused on quality outcomes, measurement, and organizational effectiveness in providing uh, high quality patient care, which will be the focus of her remarks, at least initial remarks. Erin Ron is president of Health Strategies Consultants. She's also the operating partner at Bessemer Venture Partners. Uh, he was previously president of Group Health, Group Health Inc., uh, also the medical director at Oxford and senior vice president at Beth Israel. So Aaron brings, a, again, a very unique perspective both on the provider side and payer side, and he'll be commenting on um, the stakeholders' uh, impact in terms of health policy going forward. And finally, Mark Rodman is uh, president and CEO of Bioreference Labs, which he uh, founded in 1981. That's a long time ago, Mark. Um, yeah, he's, it is. Um, <laughs> You're about as old as I am. Um, I know, but I'm still a little older than you are. So he's also assistant professor of clinical medicine at the College of Physicians and Surgeons. Mark has been an active participant in the health policy debate, uh, focused uh, largely on uh, genetic testing in terms of impact on, on managed patient care. So we're very happy to have Mark with us today. So you can see we have a, a very panel. Um, the basic focus today will be on, uh, obviously, in 45 or 50 minutes, we cannot cover the entire healthcare sector. I know it's hard to believe. Um, so the focus is going to be primarily on the health reform bill and the implications to various stakeholders in the healthcare ecosystem, hospitals, payers, uh, physicians, nurses, uh, manufacturers, suppliers, and obviously the customer. Um, and also we're going to talk about uh, technology used in the system and also data analytics as it pertains to uh, managing patient care. So it's kind of ambitious. Uh, the format we've decided on is that each of our panelists are going to spend about five to seven minutes uh, covering uh, a couple of aspects of this topic. Uh, then I will uh, ask some follow-up questions uh, based on that first round, if we have any time left um, after this first go-round, and then we'll open it up for Q&A of the audience for the last 10 or 15 minutes, we are going to end on a hard end at 7.45. Now, following this, as you know, there's a variety of industries uh, networking stations, so we can do a deep dive and allow the different sub uh, topics that we haven't, we're not going to be able to cover on the panel. But uh, again, that's the concept of the uh, stations, is to go deep dive into a lot of that material uh, later on. So that is the uh, panelists. That's the format. That's the structure, the timing. And uh, I think what we'll do is begin with uh, Professor Sherry Gleed, who is going to uh, review the entire health care reform bill in seven minutes. <laughs> I told her to eliminate the footnotes, but just to cover everything else in the bill uh, and make sure, and you have seven minutes starting now. Okay, so those of you who have been in my classes know that I'm perfectly capable of doing that. <laughs> um, but I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to refrain. It is a very complicated bill, and it's a very long bill. 
Um, it's complicated partly because it does a whole lot, and it's complicated also because in the nature of modern American politics, this is the Christmas tree that so many ornaments have been hung on. Um, so there, is a, there are a lot of details in this bill that I am not going to get to um, that touch on every aspect of the health care system you can possibly imagine and many more you've never thought about. I, I want to really just talk about three big buckets of things that the law does um, and just give you a sense of where it all is at. The first and most important and biggest bucket is, of course, the coverage expansion. Um, starts in January. Most of the attention around the coverage expansion, if you hear about it in the newspaper and so on, has been around the mandates, the individual mandate, the employer mandate. These things are not actually that important from a policy perspective in the sense of doing a lot of work. The thing that does the work in this bill is money. That's what does the work everywhere. And here you have really two big pots of money for coverage expansion. One is the Medicaid expansions, um, which are expected to cover somewhere around 15 to 20 million people across the states, depending on which governors sign on and which do not. Um, and the expansions in the private insur the reformed non-group insurance market through the health insurance exchanges, subsidies for people with incomes below 400 percent of the federal poverty level. Again, somewhere in the order of another 15 to 20 million people, depending on the estimates. If we think about these things in New York particularly, I guess it's really important to realize that the Medicaid expansion has a relatively small impact on New York because we've already expanded our Medicaid program to people with incomes below 100 percent of the federal poverty level. The federal expansion goes to 133, so it's not a big change in Medicaid eligibility in New York. On the other hand, the changes in the non-group market will be very, very large in New York because New York has a completely dysfunctional non-group market with almost nobody in it anymore. And so this market is going to be, uh, is likely to grow very substantially because of the Affordable Care Act subsidies and because of the reforms of the market and even because of the mandate. So coverage in terms of the number of people, a very large impact. We would expect to see an expansion in the use of services, especially around outpatient services and drug uh, pharmaceuticals, because we actually observe that uninsured people, when they become insured, substantially increase their use of pharmaceuticals. Second, in terms of coverage, a big improvement in the breadth and depth of coverage, particularly but not exclusively for people in the non-group market and for, of course, the uninsured. In terms of the breadth of coverage, mental health and substance use benefits, which have typically been missing from a lot of coverage in the non-group market, are now going to be required in that coverage. Um, in terms of depth of coverage, perhaps the more important, annual limits and lifetime limits are going to be eliminated. Um, that matters a lot for people who are very seriously ill. It also matters for a lot of people who, ha who if you ask them, would tell you that they have health insurance coverage, but it turns out that they have coverage with annual limits on the order of five or $10,000, really not coverage at all. So they will all be in something called, that has actual coverage elements to it that provides them catastrophic protection. And the third piece, I think, in terms of coverage to really recognize, and I think where we might see the biggest gains from a population health as well as economic perspective, is in terms of continuity of coverage. Um, if you look at the uninsured in the United States, the striking feature of them is not that they, is that they don't spend all of their lives uninsured. They move in and out of the insurance market. Something around 25 to 30 percent of the prime age working population of the United States has a spell of uninsurance in the course of a year. So one of the things that you expect to see from this expansion in coverage is not only the uninsured becoming covered, but the insured remaining covered um, throughout their, their working lives. Second big element of the law has to do with cost containment. There's a lot of argument about how much cost containment there is or is not in the law, but one important feature of it is that most of the money funding those insurance expansions comes out of the health care system itself. It is really just taking out money out of one pocket and putting it into another pocket. Um, that's because a lot of the savings come out of the Medicare program, some of them from changes in payment rates to Medicare Advantage plans. You've already heard this year there's been a lot of fuss about how those payment rates are dropping. But um, in the longer term, through changes in the formula that updates payments to hospitals and other um, non-physician providers in the Medicare program, those providers are going to be in, in, in effect, squeezed forever. The formula has changed in perpetuity in a way that is really designed to encourage those providers to think about a new business model, one in which they make money by choosing lower, lower cost, higher value ways of delivering care rather than competing by investing in ever more costly technologies. We'll see how that plays out. 
The second big element in the cost containment bundle here is the excise tax on high cost health plans, which goes into effect several years after the rest of the expansions. The idea here is to try and encourage um, the growth of lower cost health plans. How can a health plan be lower cost? Um, two possible directions. One is higher deductibles, more cost sharing in the health plans. But I think the more likely direction actually is narrower networks, more cost containment through select selective contracting uh, within health insurance, more of a move towards a more um, HMO kind of structure. That's what, we, what I think is, is a more likely direction in terms of that excise tax. The third big bucket of change I think that we uh, see that, that's in the law has to do with delivery system reform. So I'm struck by the fact that when Medicare was originally passed in 1965, it was a big expansion in coverage. This is actually a much bigger expansion in coverage than Medicare and Medicaid um, in terms of the number of people who will be newly covered. But Medicare and Medicaid, when they passed, they, those, that legislation starts with a clause that says, nothing in this act is intended to have the government of the United States change the practice of medicine. <laughs> kind of a funny thing, um, if you think retrospectively. This law, on the other hand, has an entire chapter about changing the practice of medicine. It's really about trying to change the way we do business in the healthcare system with really Medicare leading the way through a series of reforms that have many acronyms and many different names to them, but really two linked strategies that underlie them all. One is to expand the size of bundles for which we pay, and I'll get into that in a min minute, so expanding the size of the bundle. And secondly is measuring performance systematically and rewarding um, pr providers for uh, performing and not just for providing volume. So within this structure, there's a whole series of innovations that you can see in the legislation. Perhaps the simplest one to think about is bundled payments. It's an initiative out of the CMS Innovation Center that says to hospitals, you can come to us with one of several models of bundled payments. One of them is we pay for all inpatient services, both the hospital fees and all the physician fees together in a single bundle. Right? So you get both the hospital and physician fee together in a bundle, and you figure out how to divide it up among your physicians and your hospital. Or we pay for hospital and post-acute care in a single bundle, and you figure out how to divide it up. So we expand the size of the bundle. At the same time, we measure a lot of quality outcomes to make sure that people are not skimping on care within those bundles. So that's kind of one model. The model you might have heard about more is called the Accountable Care Organization. It's actually formally known as the Medicare Shared Savings Program. Same idea, a bunch of doctors and hospitals and other providers get together. They, they go ahead and they bill for services in the traditional way, but if they can save money relative to what Medicare was expecting, they share in those savings, again, across this bundle of services that they deliver with a, a rigorous system of quality measurement behind it. Several others in the same sort of vein. One is value-based purchasing. Hospitals are expected to perform along the lines of readmissions and unacceptable hospital events and other things like that. Otherwise, they are penalized. Or perhaps uh, the one that I think it, it has a lot of potential, the programs for dual eligibles, people who are eligible for both Medicare and Medicaid. Traditionally, the payment for Medicare came from the Medicare program, and the payment for the Medicaid services delivered to exactly the same patients came from the state Medicaid program. The idea is to bundle those payments, have a single set of payments, and provide some rationale for integrating care and delivering it more uh, comprehensively and in a, in a more coordinated fashion. Again, measuring quality outcomes to make sure that it works. Um, so these are all, you can sort of see as you think about them all together, that they're all within the same framework, cutting up little different pieces of the pie. So let me just close with a few, very few observations. First of all, I think this is the make or break moment for the private insurance industry in the, in the United States. Uh, the largest, the, the peak of this industry in terms of number of lives covered came in 2000. The industry has been shrinking since 2000 in terms of the number of people covered. Um, this is an enormous new population, some 37 million people who will enter either via Medicaid or the exchanges into coverage. Um, if the insurance industry is to have a future, it's going to be by managing this population and taking ownership of it. Otherwise, I think it's, it's hard to see where it goes from here within the United States. Second, I think you see a pretty pronounced shift away from the hospital as the center of care. Um, you see that both in the newly insured who are going to be using outpatient and pharmaceutical services more and in the shifts in payment within the Medicare program. 
And third, a real emphasis on trying to encourage cost-conscious choices throughout the system, not only on the consumer side, where we've heard a lot about it in the past, but also on the provider side through these bundled payment kinds of initiatives. So let me stop there. So now you have, you're all experts in the health care reform bill. <laughs> uh, there will be a quiz at the end. Uh, it's multiple choice. Um, you can also understand how Sherry can teach an entire class in one hour, <laughs> an uh, entire course. So uh, Pat, um, the nurses play a major role in all this, especially to improve patient care and cut costs and everything, right? They certainly do. Okay. So th that was perfect introduction for what I wanted to talk about, um, which is really what the nursing profession can expect with these changes and what the public can expect from the nursing profession um, with these changes. With the expansion of the insurance, it's clear that we don't have enough primary care providers, and so we will need more primary care providers, and that's gonna be physicians, that's gonna be uh, physician's assistants, and it's gonna be nurse practitioners. And as nurses, we're gonna need, there's been 50 years of research on nurse practitioners, and they provide high quality care that's safe and less expensive. We need to continue to uh, educate the nurse practitioners um, we need to make sure that the nursing schools are gearing up to do that. And we need to make sure that we're working in the appropriate interdisciplinary teams. Um, it's, there are some, even in this time, which is quite friendly for nurse practitioners, there are scope of practice issues that differ state to state. And as a profession, and hopefully we can get some of this sorted out, but nurse practitioners in some states, they can prescribe, some, you know, some places they can prescribe um, some drugs, some other, it's very different state to state. There's also um, differences based on the organization where they work on, and some of that's historical, and there's just some organizational um, barriers, and we need to have the sort of right environment. So every Buddy can work at their full scope of practice. And I, and I really believe that we are at a time when that will happen. So that's sort of exciting for nurses. And as consumers, I think you'll be seeing more nurse practitioners in your um, primary, you know, in your interdisciplinary teams that you're going to or just even going to nurse practitioners. I think you'll, you can expect to see that. Um, with the change in quality, um, whether it's bundled payments or the hospital value-based purchasing or the readmissions um, reduction program, I think within, this is gonna affect nurses quite a bit that are working in these institutions because often they're, they're the ones that are collecting a lot of these measures. Some of the measures come from claims data, others come from um, nurses collecting the data. And another important measure that we're moving to is to really think about how the patient perceives the care. So um, I'm very happy to see that an important measure within the hospital, not only is it what we call these patient safety indicators, which are based on claims data, which are rare events that don't happen, and I don't think a lot of things are gonna really, we're gonna see a lot with these patient safety indicators, but we're also um, using HCAPs, which is the satisfaction scores. And within the age caps, some of the things that we have seen that really are important indicators is our multi-dimensional uh, satisfaction scores. But um, how responsive were, were the hospital staff? How was communication with your nurses and how was communication with your doctors? And it's that communication with the nurses and responsiveness of staff, which is very indicative of overall patient satisfaction. So nurses are gonna be pressured to make sure that they're providing that care, as we should be. And you can expect that people, if you're in a hospital or somebody that you know is in a hospital, that they might very well get a satisfaction score that they're supposed to be filling out later. Um, the unintended consequences of, you know, the overall goal of this measurement is really good. It's to have facilities improve care with important outcomes. A potential unintended consequence with some of these mandatory reportings, with, with some things and some of these metrics, is that it focuses a facility on, on the measurement and not on their local issue. And hopefully that won't happen, and hopefully we'll still find ways to provide the quality of care. But there's a lot, and some people say, 
well, heck, you know, we won't, um, we'll have to hire more people to do these measurements and we're going to have to lower staff and, you know, you hear about all these horrible scenarios, but I don't think that'll happen. Um, specifically with the uh, big focus on readmissions reductions, uh, in October of 2013, uh, Medicare beneficiaries will, uh, they won't be paying for readmissions of heart failure, pneumonia, and acute my myocardial inf infarction. And in 2015, that's going to expand to even more services. I think that that's very important um, for, for nursing because nursing sort of provides, a, is the provider that coordinates care, and there's been a lot of research about transitions of care and how to help often vulnerable patients go across these transitions. And I think we need new innovative models. We need to be using the models that we have good research about that um, promote having somebody providing that transition that's in the hospital and works with the interdisciplinary team in the hospital and provides the care outside. We, we have to do a better job at those trans transitions. Otherwise, people are getting sent home with a list about what, what medications they're supposed to be taking. Um, they go to their primary care doctor or their nurse practitioner. They don't have the list. Things get changed and they're back in the hospital. So we've got to spend a lot more time on the transitions and we can do a better job. And I think I'll stop. Okay. And that's okay. great, Pat. Thanks so much, um, Aaron. Just continuing the uh, the theme of uh, catalyst for change and uh, your kind of top five list of changes that people should be aware of going yeah, forward. If I had more time, I would have done top ten, but I'm going to do five. Each one uh, will be one minute. Um, so I, I'd like to uh, just go through the top my top five list of catalysts of change and. Um, First, think about what the current state of the healthcare system is. Uh, and it's said about the healthcare system that basically every system is perfectly designed to get the results that are achieved. And our system right now is achieving results that are uh, deliver poor, basically poor quality, high cost, with limited access. And it's right for disruption and for uh, and for change. Uh, there are two major reasons for uh, for these results. Um, I think that uh, you know, the major one is that there's fragmentation of the system and the other is around how we pay uh, for services, the fee-for-service model. Uh, we have a fragmented, uncoordinated system. There are 700,000 docs, many still in solo practice, uh, 6,000 6, hospitals, 700 managed care plans, and millions of employers. Uh, so it's totally fragmented. Uh, and every one of these people wake up uh, each day to try to figure out how to maximize their income through a fee-for-service model and not, and not through coordinating care. Um, so uh, let me just go through what, what I, so this is a setup for disruption and for change. Uh, and I think there are basically five catalysts to that change. So let me just go through each one of those. The first one is that there's gonna be a change in how we pay from uh, basically volume or fee-for-service to value or capitation-based uh, uh, payment. Sherry went through some of the pay payment changes in the ACA, uh, but um, uh, many of the payers in, uh, are looking for alternative ways of changing as well, not just through the government. A lot of the pay is, is now going to be based on improvements in patient satisfaction, clinical measures that will lead to better pay outcomes and population-based uh, care. Uh, examples now, uh, health plans are now getting reimbursed by the government based on their results of HEDIS, QAR, consumer satisfaction. The star rating severity uh, adjustment when I was uh, running a health plan worth tens of millions of dollars to the health plan. It was the difference between profit and loss. And when something makes a difference between profit and loss, you spend a lot of energy and focus on trying to uh, get those results right. Uh, another example of change in payment uh, is uh, not just pay payment based on uh, outcomes, but basically total capitation. And there's an example of a company called CareMore, which has turned the model around on its head. It took the sickest uh, Medicare patients, managed to put in clinical protocols, managed to uh, uh, do preventive type care, uh, and uh, made enormous profits and recently was sold for about $800 million after just a couple of years in business. So again, these models of care work, and they're gonna be, we're gonna see more and more of those uh, in the market. The next uh, major catalyst is around information technology. Uh, consumers are now getting more and more used to getting uh, immediate interaction and information, including personalized information. Uh, IT is going to break, break down the lack of transparency in healthcare. Basically, when you go in and you're getting healthcare, you really have no idea of the quality of the cost. Uh, IT capabilities will enable 
people to figure out what their cost, what the cost is going uh, to be for the services they're getting, and what the quality is. And there's new companies that are being developed. Castlight, Blue Book are new companies that are now out there providing this information to uh, individuals so they can make wise choices when they're purchasing. Uh, there's also other companies called uh, ZocDoc Eye Triage, which allow uh, consumer engagement and easier selection of physicians. Um, the next uh, is the change in role of government, and AACA is one example of that change. But uh, government pays for about $800 million out of the $2.8 billion spent on health care each year, so it's an, has an enormous impact. So recently, Medicare changed how uh, it's paying uh, hospitals based on readmissions, uh, and that caused an enormous ripple throughout the whole hospital community. Hospitals said that they could never control uh, what went on after the, uh, after the patient left the hospital. All of a sudden, they were totally engaged in how to uh, manage that care uh, because it had an enormous financial impact uh, on them. Um, uh, also, uh, the, uh, uh, it was mentioned the change from uh, fee-for-service to episode of care. Uh, the federal government's moving and trying to build ACOs in order to kind of just pay in a bundle. New York State uh, Medicaid budget is about $54 billion out of a $110 billion uh, total budget. Uh, it pays 300 million checks per year to providers. It wants to get out of that business, and it's successfully doing so. It's going to be, be paying intermediaries to manage care and let them pay and manage that care in a more effective way. Uh, and that includes paying for uh, long-term care, dual eligibles, and others. We're also seeing major changes in organizations that are, exist in response to some of these changes. Uh, we're moving from, physicians are changing how they practice. They're moving from a, basically a physician-centric to a patient-centric models. They're moving to team-based care. Uh, large organizations are trying to manage large populations of patients. Uh, there's consolidation of different entities. Provider groups are being bought by ho uh, hospitals. More and more hospitals are, are uh, purchasing physicians. Uh, in the year 2000, there about 10 percent of specialists were employed by hospitals, now 25 percent. 20 percent of uh, PCPs, primary care physicians, were employed by hospitals, now 40 percent are. This trend is accelerating, and we'll see more and more of that. Uh, there's also integration of providers and insurers. WellPoint purchased Monarch Medical Group of 2,300 physicians. Highmark bought Allegheny Medical System, which is five hospital system and, and physicians, and Humana bought Concert Concerta. Finally, industry barriers are changing. Uh, uh, entities and uh, companies outside the health insurance, uh, that are typically outside of health insurance are now entering uh, the health insurance world and they're gonna uh, cause significant disruptions. In the last decade, we saw a convergence of technology, telecommunications, media, and consumer electronics. The same's happening in healthcare as technology and the retail sector is entering uh, the healthcare space. Now retail clinics uh, provide direct patient care. And uh, since the year 2000, 1,000 new retail uh, uh, sort of dock in the box or walk-in clinics have uh, started in CVS and in in, uh, in Target, Walmart, uh, and Walgreens. They have high patient satisfaction to provide uh, uh, quicker care, higher patient cons uh, 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 a quicker uh, response uh, than uh, physician offices do. You're going to see more and more of that. There'll be more, more integration of telemedicine and more and more coordination of care through these type of entities. So uh, to sum up quickly, the top five, uh, basically value-based purchasing, IT, consumerism, changes in government payment, and collapse of industry barriers and organizational changes is going to lead to enormous changes in how care is delivered and the healthcare system. Aaron, thanks very much. Mark? Well, I Given all that detail, I'm not quite sure where to be able to go in and start. So let me just go back a little bit. There are clearly trends that are occurring, and there are ripple effects down from Washington. But at some point, we need to go have a conversation with ourselves on where, in fact, we're going to go in and be in healthcare. Because we hear a lot about healthcare costs are just so skyrocketing. And we know about how they're increasing as a percentage of GDP. And you know what affects on a lot of people. And a lot of the issues about the torment it puts on individual lives may or may not directly be involved in how, how the system is set up right now and how it may be doomed for eventual failure. But we have to talk to ourselves about what we want and what we need and what we're like as a people. Medicare spends three times as much money on someone with chronic kidney disease than they do with someone who doesn't. 
by the time the Medicare patient comes in, that's the first time they're touching them. It belongs to often either no insurance or private insurance before that. And in some ways, for people at that point, the die is cast. They spend 10 times as much money on someone on kidney dialysis. And at 65, you're either going to be there or you're not. It's important to know. We don't do a lot to actively manage. We're doing more now than what we did, but we don't do a lot for those personal choices, that low-hanging fruit. Then once you get sick, we all have heard about people and the cost of people in their last year of life. This is touchy areas. This is serious issues. Because when we all go through this in our own lives, no one says we're going to approach this differently. We in technology now can do some pretty remarkable things. And, and not all advances in technology have to be bad. They don't have to go in and just end up costing the system more money. We can go in and sequence a tumor now for $500. That's pretty neat stuff. We can go look at 100 mutations that you would have, and there may be five or six drugs that you can use accordingly, and there may be another 40 that are in clinical trials. And if it's your relative who has lung cancer and it's new and they think they get it out, you want to go do it and know what that is. That sounds great. That sounds efficient. But then you realize that the new drugs that are in clinical trials all cost $100,000 a year. And then you realize that for many of them to get approved, you may end up do it on the basis that life expectancy is going to increase for six months. And then you go realize that the costs that are associated with those last six months are incredibly high. There are a myriad of issues that are affecting healthcare. And one of the problems when you start talking about it is that everything gets kind of dumped into the bucket. And there are coverage issues and there are critical issues. And if clearly the Affordable Care Act, if you had a look at your multiple choice of three issues you have, you know, if you had three issues, probably one, two, and three were coverage, and then the other ones had other areas behind it that were affected. And we have to get used to that. And there are issues in terms of what the power and the role of Medicare is being, because this is kind of a pretty much of a relatively, you know, crowd, liberal crowd, of which I'm part of it. So we talk about this as Medicare being in reality. There's a whole rest of the world that looks at voucher plans that does the end of Medicare, Medicare as we know it. But Medicare does have power. And the power to punish, reward, and publicize is a powerful thing in healthcare. But all of those issues are kind of separate from where we are in what we spend on health care and what we choose to spend in health care. It's great to say that we're going to get the best, the latest, whatever we know, and we'll choose the most cost-effective ways to increase quality of life, length of life, and that the end of life will be serene. You can say all that. We have to decide whether we're willing and what we're willing to do. And part of that equation is not to say that we are going to spend wrong, we're going to spend for fraud, we're going to spend for waste, because no one's going to do that. But one of the things we have to decide as a people is whether or not we as a country and what we're like and whether we will end up, because of our own nature, spend more for health care than the examples of other nationalities and their approach is different. It's not a question a lot of people ask. You go to a room like this and you talk about people, they talk about end of life care in, I don't mean to go market in Scandinavian countries, I don't know who I'm insulting, or other areas of like that and what it's gonna be very different. It's a debate we have to have with ourselves. We're changing. Medicare is changing. As we talked about before, Part A payments have actually gone down. Medicare doesn't know what to do about it. They've talked about it a little bit. They're kind of afraid to say that it's going down and that it's going to go up again, and they're going to say, ah, we got you. It's all, we're all foolish. But they are, because people are getting scared about change. They're policing themselves. We admission rates, as we talked before, is a hot item now, because it's quantifiable and it's there. It costs more. Stop it. It's going to be worked on. But the underlying, but the underlying issue of cost something that we have to talk among ourselves. And that's when the issues get pretty hard. OK. <laughs> we start drinking now? 
Um, why don't we take a quick uh, a few questions from the audience? Um, and again, you must ask questions that the entire room would be interested in. <laughs> Not just yourself. So we will start with this young man here on the aisle. I'm Dick Pearson, Professor of Medicine from Columbia University. Uh, in my lifetime, we have gone from a non-for-profit health insurance system to a for-profit health insurance system. And if I had picked one thing that had most radically changed the course of medical care, I, I was on the board of Blue, uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield Empire for 12 years. When I started there, it was 7.8% overhead or cost of running it. When it went for profit in 1992, four years later, we were up to 31%. And the difference between 7.8% and 31%, I'm not well trained in economics, but I could tell that difference. <laughs> and there had to be one biggest piece. There's another little piece about the pharmaceutical in industry and the uh, medical uh, uh, equipment industry, which are also uh, pretty big cost items, but they're for profit is to me the, the most serious error that we have made along the way. And it seems to me that's got to be addressed, understood, and uh, something done about it. Well, panel, um, I guess the issue is whether, whether the reform bill uh, addresses any of these issues. Certainly on the payer side, it's attempting to address some of the issues, especially on the admin costs. Uh, any re response um, from the panel? So there is a provision in the Affordable Care Act that limits the amount that insurance companies, whether they're for profit or not for profit, can spend on administrative and overhead costs, um, which isn't, which sort of addresses some of the concern that you raised there. I, I would say that um, the cross-national evidence on this is quite interesting because there are countries that do much better than we do that have for profit insurance companies. Um, so we are not the only people with for profit insurance companies, but ours are more out of control. <laughs> Uh, I was at, I've been at Presbyterian since 1977, and I remember when we had one vice president <laughs> in the entire system. <laughs> and the hospital had its issues, but did, certainly did, you know, run fine. Do we, how many VPs of uh, Columbia do we have in the room? <laughs> <laughs> well, okay, I, mean, the other way, I think safe, the huh? other way to put it is that if you add in how many VPs of Columbia there are, it would equal the number in the room. Ah, okay. <laughs> We get your point. All right, let's, uh, anybody else with a comment? Yeah, I, I do some venture capital, but I don't think of myself as a crazy capitalist. But uh, I do, you know, I do think the profit motives is throughout the healthcare system. It's not just the insurers. It's physicians, when they're practicing, are trying to maximize their income as well. I mean, the, you know, it, it may be slightly different, but still, at the end of the day, that drives a lot of some of their behavior. The other thing is that I work for a not-for-profit health insurer as well, and I'm not sure that they act that much different or frankly more noble than the for-profit one. So um, yeah. Yeah. that's my confession, but don't, don't tell my former employer. <laughs> okay, it, Pat, it, uh, final comment on this and we'll move it, on to another I question. Think Sherry or some other people probably know more about this, but from the hospital providers um, and hospital organizations, there's evidence that the not-for-profits are not acting any different than the yeah. for-profits. Um, they're just getting the tax breaks and but there's still quite a good margin and growth ability. Okay, this side of the room, what do we got? Question? Uh, Rob Guru, uh, I have a fundamental question, and I think uh, hey. oh, no. Aaron, you touched on this, as did some of the others. And the question is, why do we continue to ignore the policies and practices of of every advanced country <laughs> and that covers all their citizens uh, and spends about half of what they do in terms of GDP. They spend something like 17% and they spend something like 8 to 10%. All the advanced countries cover everyone. <coughs> Why do we continue to ignore that? Except I think this new act does have some band-aids. I don't think it's a fundamental change, but they do have Okay, so a common question as to uh, why costs uh, are such disparity and uh, with allegedly the same outcomes. So who wants to answer that question no. once and for all? <laughs> well, the final answer is that uh, 
basically, the, you know, there's a lot of evidence now that the, the reason that our costs are higher is that we pay more for the same services that other countries get. It's not necessarily higher utilization, although there's some higher utilization, but on a per unit basis for what we get for each type, for each service, we pay more. So ultimately, we're paying the physicians more, we're paying others more. There is a component of administration cost as well, but that's not the major factor. It's actually, we pay more per every unit of service that we get. So ultimately, if we want to control that cost, we're going to have to drive down that, that payment. I hate to say it to the, any doctors in the room. but Sherry, does Washington look outside uh, at all? I mean, outside of Washington, so, but even um, outside the country? <laughs> <laughs> Do they, do, they, do they care at all or not really? So, so I actually got to participate as the Department of Health and Human Services delegate to the OECD. To, so we did actually go and learn from all the other countries what they were doing. But then we could not then talk you about it. Um, <laughs> we didn't ignore it, but we couldn't talk about it because um, for some reason in education policy, the Secretary of Education can stand before the American public and talk about how poorly we do in education statistics. And everybody thinks that's really useful from a policy perspective, but the Secretary of Health and Human Services could never stand up and say the U.S. ranks 37th or something in life expectancy and spends twice as much money as anyone else. So I don't know. I mean, if you ask most American, most politicians on the Hill, they think that the reason other countries save money is because they have death panels and, uh, and you, wait, you know, uh, and you wait, wait three years for, three an, years for an operation. And, and that's the general feeling in Washington. And no number, no amount of facts seems to change that. I, I do say, I would say this, I, I would say one consoling thing. I worked on the Clinton health reform plan and I worked on the Obama health reform plan. When we worked on the Clinton reform plan, everywhere we went, people would say, but if you pass health reform, you'll destroy the best healthcare system in the world. And I have to say that in two years in Washington, I never heard anyone say that. Hmm. Okay. They don't, think, we have they don't think they know, I think it's now the view that we have the best healthcare system in the world is essentially dead. Hmm. Okay, this side of the room? What we got? Right behind you, uh, Emily? Hi, I just wanted to thank all the panelists for their very insightful remarks. Um, but I also wanted to, to uh, mention that one area I think you left out uh, was the role of the medical home and, and, and the impact that we as nurse practitioners are having in, in developing okay. those, those new models of healthcare. And I think that particularly the gentleman who's in, health, who's in healthcare consulting would be very excited to know about what good work we're doing as nurse practitioners in developing clinical relationships and new models for delivery of healthcare that, uh, that, that are basically open access and ensure continuity of care and access to care in a okay. very fragmented delivery system. All right, again, in 45 minutes, there's only so much I we know, can cover but here, but uh, have anybody have a comment on medical homes? And I, I had a question. I, I just wanted to, you know, the question being is like, what do you all think is the future of accountable care organizations? And for the last time I checked, they hadn't, uh, they hadn't okay. talked about the role of um, NPs in accountable care organizations particularly with regard to gaining traction in the New York State area? Well, I, I think with an accountable care organization, they're going to figure out what's um, cost effective fairly quickly. Um, Sherry was saying that she thought that accountable care organizations is sort of the way, you know, that we might actually get more in managed care. And I do think the role of the nurse practitioner is, is being felt more. Also in the Affordable Care Act, there was the nurse managed uh, Clinics, there's like 50 million dollars, which is very small, in, uh, you know, for the nurse managed uh, health centers, um, where they provide care to very vulnerable populations, and just recognition of that is enough. But I do think it's a time for nurse pa the nurse practitioners. I think it's an exciting time for nurses, and I think the role is going to expand um, with multiple multiple ways with, with the, these changes. But there is That's a lot of skepticism provide. to ACOs. There's no question about yeah. it. So Aaron, why don't you comment on that? You've been on, you've been on both sides, providers and yeah, physician I, and payers. Is I, it? I th first of all, uh, I, think the, I think the concept of the ACO is a great concept. And I do also think that you know, nurse practitioners should have a much expanded role and should play a much larger role in, in the healthcare system. Um, having said that, I think that probably about half to three quarters of the ACOs that are now being developed are likely to fail. Uh, and that uh, that's probably going to take be a trade, there's probably a transition model to another type of uh, uh, way of transferring the risk onto the uh, to providers. So um, I think it's going to be part of a learning process. And I think that ultimately will come out with another sort of model. But I think most I think just watch that most of these are ultimately going to fail. Yeah, you know, Cliff and I probably are the only people here old enough to remember all the three-letter 
acronyms of changes in healthcare. I'm flattered. <laughs> um, you know, we go through a lot of three-letter things. It's a big deal in healthcare. <laughs> you know, those of us old enough remember what HMOs were. We remember what IPAs were. They still have them. They're still around somewhere in the area. Um, SGP, yes. specialty group practices, mm -hmm. 150 oncologists banding together to be able to go in and take reimbursement. MSP, who lives in Westchester, Scarsdale, Mount Kisco, medical practices, Summit Medical Group. These are large groups that are, that are medical based who are looking for ways to take on risk. IDNs, integrated delivery networks, big deal a few years ago. ACOs, another one, which is going to be there. We're not sure. These are all payment models that we're trying to do. When the initial announcement was made out of a lot of ACOs, a lot of the larger integrated delivery centers did not participate in ACOs because they felt they had already made so many improvements in many of the measures that were going to be seen that they wouldn't end up getting more. So it was some other ones who thought they can go and use that as an impetus to get improvement. But what is clear is that providers are changing. They're organizing themselves in different ways. And I don't know if those are the, if, if we'll sit here five years from now and whether there'll be ACOs or there'll be some other three letter word to describe it. But providers will all change to ways to deal with new payment methods. But I don't know if that one's going to be the one that works. Okay. Other questions? I see a hand up in the middle, I think. Whoop, Hi. Uh, the question I have is, I. I'm recalling when I was doing doctoral work in nursing. Hi, Pat. Hi, Diane. Um, <laughs> sure, we have a lot of nurses here today. And took an elective course well, with Steve Albert um, in Mailman in the uh -huh. School of Public Health. He made a comment that how we live our first 50 years largely may determine how we live our second. And since today is my birthday and I've passed the middle <laughs> 50, uh -oh. the question I have is, do you think we may actually go down a path where my lifestyle choices will be incentivized or disincentivized related to my health care. Meaning, whether I eat too much, don't exercise, smoke, use illicit, or illicit well, substances. Mayor, Mayor Bloomberg has anything to say about right? it. Well. <laughs> soda. Well, good thing I don't like soda. But what do you think about um, the potential for insurance to go the path of almost mandating lifestyle change? So I don't just come to you as a provider and say you need to fix me. So it's no, already let's there. talk about the government. I mean, there's government, there's corporate. I mean, there's a lot of potential uh, incentives here. So it's already there in two, in two places, actually, in that one already existing in the other one uh, and expanded in the other one in the law. One is that uh, smokers will have to pay more for insurance um, in non-group market everywhere. And also that employers can offer incentives, quite substantial incentives, on insurance premiums to people who... Uh, follow wellness programs of different sorts. So there's actually fairly substantial incentives. I would argue actually incentives that are larger than the cost of the healthcare conditions that are related to them. Um, uh, that to encourage people in exactly this way to, to, to follow uh, good behavior. The, in the incentives are huge. Okay, uh, we have a question in front. Just okay. shout it out. Right. It's really hard to say. Um, there have been some wellness programs that have been very rigorously evaluated and that seem to work. Um, there are an awful lot that have been not very rigorously evaluated and about which there's a lot of hype. You got a lot of um, pushback from the employees also on those yeah, corporate people programs. People don't love them. Uh, I mean, it's very challenging to do it right, and it's very challenging to evaluate it right. So I think it's, it, it's as much... Um, about getting people to think about it as it is the content of the programs themselves. Okay. Behavioral um, change is always difficult, and it takes a long time to see if the behavioral change will stay. Um, and that, that's the hard part. I just don't, you know, the question is, are the incentives strong enough to cause that change? Yeah. I'm not sure they are. This side of the room. Okay, we'll try you one more time. So I, I have a question about physicians. Um, we talked about uh, nurses, and I think part of the, the part of the reason nurses are in such demand is because doctors are in such short supply. Um, we know that in this country, there's a significant uh, there's projected very significant deficit in primary care physicians. 
And the only specialty in the US that's projected to have enough physicians is, I think, dermatologists and plastic surgeons. And the reason is because that's where the money is. Now, every possible reform means one thing for physicians. It means their compensation is likely to go down in the future. And yet the cost of entry, i.e. medical school, is the highest of the graduate education. What can be done to change that calculation? Uh, Mark, um, Aaron, you. Well, did you read the did you read the recent article about vets? Don't become a veterinarian in the New York Times. It's wor it's it's wor it's worse than physicians. Much worse. <laughs> and and well, yet feel, veterinary feel schools are full. Um, well, you know what? It's worse. It's yeah. It is. Except that I will tell you that we will go be reimbursed for a hemoglobin A1C, which is important to know whether you have diabetes. Maybe four dollars. Try to go in and do a glucose level on a dog, and see, <laughs> and you'll you'll get charged eighty dollars or ninety dollars for it. <laughs> Because people there demand and they'll pay for it. So it, it's not the same thing for all providers. No, but it is a I, it's a serious question on the physician yeah, side. So, uh, I think Aaron, <laughs> I'm trying I to get, like your, trying to get your question answered. Here, I thought that was far more interesting. I tried to do the serious thing. Let's do a serious. For just one question. So the, uh, I think that um, particularly for primary care docs, I think that this is sort of, this is sort of a potential opportunity here. Uh, primary care docs basically get paid about 4% of the total health care dollar and control probably about 80 or 90 percent of it. And if they can structure themselves, particularly through ACOs or other types of arrangements, then they can really capture a lot, much larger share of that dollar going forward and they can control that dollar going down, downstream. And, that, and a lot of these models are structured, including the medical home and others, specifically to incentivize uh, the primary care doctors to do and coordinate care in different ways than they have. But again, I think I'm not sure yet whether that opportunity is going to be taken yet, but there's certainly, it certainly is there to be taken. So how are we yeah. going to reduce the cost of medical school, Aaron? Well, Mark? let me let me answer let me answer Spend it seriously. endowment. Let me, <laughs> let me answer it seriously. <laughs> I don't know if it's going to change. Competition for medical students have never been harder. The ranking and the prestige of medical schools depends on how many will go into academic medicine and will go in and publish and go into specialty areas. And the talk about going in and loving a primary care physician has been going on for 15 years, and it really has not done a lot to go in and change the, the uh, career choices of many people in medical school. And it's a failing that we have in the system, which is why we have reliance more on physician assistants, why we have the role of nurse practitioners that simply have to go be used in a more effective way to provide more care of what's going to be done. Because I'm not sure that the entire system we have, and not just of Columbia, and not just of Cornell, but of the whole system, is going to be able to be trained to really move people in those areas. We've been talking about those incentives. But you know, when you're talking about you know, surgical specialties, making high six figures and having to come down, you're barely going to be able to change the equation to get people who do primary care to have them able to go make more. So it is a hard problem, and it's going to mean getting more people involved in care, more paraprofessionals, more nurses involved in care to be able to do it, because the academic systems are so arranged to go train specialists. It's what they get their own satisfaction for. They're in business of training doctors. They're not necessarily in the business of providing ultimate care. And that's a discontinuation or a, a uh, you know, a separation of interest, and that's where you don't get a resolution. Just to add that I'm on the board of a company that's developing primary care centers, and the, their starting salaries for the uh, primary care docs in the, is in the $300,000 $300, base range. So it's not a bad start out of medical school. So again, this, some of that's beginning to change. OK, we have time for uh, two more questions, I think. Yes? <laughs> So I don't let's, know. Let's dump on the hospitals for a while. Go ahead. Take a shot. <laughs> so I don't know if you saw there was a. I'm trying to remember whose column it was, but somebody had a. Uh, picture up recently on hospital construction investment, which has plummeted in the last three years. So uh, I think actually the message may be getting through that that may not be the way to make money in the future. But That's what we got to, I mean, it certainly has been the way to make money until now. Uh, it's been build a, build a fancier hospital and buy more toys for it. Um, in, in economics, we call it the medical care arms race. Um, 
Uh, that's certainly been the model that has been going, and the question is whether you can um, put enough pressure on the margins to make it more lucrative to try and be more efficient rather than simply trying to bring in volume with, with uh, but we'll see. Any more comments on the hospital strategy? Well, um, the one comment I would say is that I was at a, we were at a meeting with uh, Secretary Sebelius, and she was talking about the future of hospitals and the size of some of them and what they were going to do. And before realizing it was quite a, more of a public forum than was realized, was asked about the future of small hospitals. And I don't think it was necessarily a positive future looking forward to it because of the size of larger hospitals and their ability to gobble up other ones and grow for more efficiency, which puts more of a strain on rural hospitals and those that are really necessary for the areas. It's a byproduct to the question of payments. It's a byproduct to be able to go in for survival. And it's something which is there. And the larger are going to be larger. And if they can figure out how to do the payments better and provide more services, they will go in and infringe upon the smaller hospitals unless they define a very special role that they can do something that the other ones can't. Sherry, uh, when does the Justice Department finally say no to a lot of these hospital mergers? Because they, I mean, the bill basically encourages size to some extent. But at some point, it gets too much, yes? Right, so the antitrust, as part of the ACO legislation, there were extensive negotiations with the antitrust and Justice Department to try and figure out what exactly you could do in order to reduce, I mean, incre increase horizontal competition while reducing vertical competition, which is sort of the idea here. Um, and we'll see whether, you know, how, how uh, what happens in the hospital merger business. Between 2000 and 2010 hospital mergers, the hospital system creation is actually a phenomenon of the late 90s and early 2000s. It slowed down after that. Um, it was really an effort to negotiate with managed care. It's been relatively nat nat nationwide, not so much since then. But, we, but now you see the hospitals gobbling up the physician groups. And we'll see what that does to competition yeah. in the physician market. Okay, I'm afraid we are out of time. Uh, we'd like to thank our panelists for coming this evening.